Hi, welcome to Fem Pharma's Facebook Live on sex positivity and sexual confidence. I'm Jerry DiPiano, the CEO of Fem Pharma Consumer Healthcare and the Mia Vita product line for women. I'm joined by my fabulous guest, Dr. Juliana Hauser. Dr. Juliana Hauser leads conversations about relationships, agency, sexuality, intimacy, and so much more with approachability, professionalism, expertise, and fun. She studied and received her PhD in counseling education from the College of William & Mary. Dr. Juliana is also a thought leader and sexpert, diving deep into the hard to have conversations that we should all be having. Dr. Juliana has spent decades counseling and supporting thousands of individuals, both men and women, individuals and their partners on their paths to discover their sexual agency, relationship intimacy, and a fulfilling sexual connection. Now the jewel of Dr. Juliana's offering is the revealed course. And I encourage you to, to take the time to investigate this on her website. She also certifies others to facilitate the course in eight countries. So if you wanna connect with Dr. J, check out drjuliana.com. But this evening, she is Femme Pharma's guest. So welcome, welcome, oh, welcome. Thank you so much, Terry. I'm excited for this conversation. Well, we, we met the first time when we were um, on the podcast with Dr. Uh, Valda Wright, who is another favorite woman and professional and thought leader in the area. And so I'm so excited that you agreed to join us on Facebook Live. You know, one of the, the things that always, um, it, it's always a question that I have for any guest is what inspired you to do the great work? And in your case, um, inspiring the work of helping others to develop sexual self-confidence and sexual positivity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I love that question. It's funny because um, I actually started off as a kindergarten teacher. So when people hear that, that's where my education began and where my first job really was. Uh, and they're like, how did, how, wait, how do you go from kindergarten teacher to talking about sexuality and agency um, like you do? And for me, it's been an interesting journey. I think when, it, when I go back to where was the seed planted for me, it was um, in college. And I went to this really wonderful school uh, in Kentucky that when I was there was 850 students, very small. And so we had we really had very close relationships and we had um, this kind of bubble that we were living in. And what I saw with the group of friends that I made there was that we all came to our relationships and to the experience of college with a lot of variety and different backgrounds. But what we did was we created we created a group um, that had these like unspoken rules that you were supposed to show up as authentically. Your background didn't matter as you got to claim your own path and you got to say what you wanted and needed and what you're experiencing without judgment, without pressure to do it in one way. There was no one right way to do things. And I, I didn't realize what a gift it was. I thought that was just what happened in college. And I realized in the years later that that changed me. It wasn't just so much the conversations about sex that were happening, which was fun and interesting and new for me, but it was that I was in an environment where I could be authentic and I was asked to be authentic. And that, that changed what I thought of myself. It changed how I connected with other people. And when I left that environment and saw, oh gosh, not everybody is like, not everybody is like that. Then I, um, I found that I needed that in an environment to feel safe to really explore who I am. And that changed a lot for me. And when later, many years and many other kind of career maneuvers back, when I when I went to Women and Mary and really started focusing on sexuality, I realized it needed to be within that topic. I wanted to teach that, taught that skill set and create that environment in the topic of sexuality. Because if you can understand agency, if you can under if you can show up authentically as a sexual being to yourself and to other people, because sexuality is so difficult, because it's fluid and ever changing, because it is something that everyone has an opinion on. <laughs> and it's rarely the opinion that you're doing it right. 
uh, or you have enough of it or those kinds of things. If you can figure out those skills within such a convoluted topic, then you can do that in other parts of your life, like your career, your relationships, your friendship. And that's a game changer. When, when we discuss agency, so for those of us or for those that are listening in that aren't familiar with the term agency, perhaps you could just spend a couple minutes describing or a minute or two uh, discussing agency. Yes, and I could talk for two hours, so I appreciate that, the time frame of it. So um, this is a word that is becoming um, pretty common. Uh, you're hearing it a lot more often uh, in the past year or so, but it's been something I've been working on for 20 years. I, I look at it in, in one sentence at first, which is agency is a noun, it's a verb, it's a concept, and it's a skill. And I'll talk mainly about why it is a skill. And this is my favorite part to teach people. But the, the warning is this. This is going to sound very obvious. It's going to sound like this is not rocket science. And, and, and it actually, it's simple, but it's not easy. So here are the five steps that I believe are pivotal in understanding what agency is. First is, is that you know there's a decision to be made. Second is that you feel confident that you can make a good decision, a wise decision for you with purpose and intention. Third is you make the decision. You just do it. You, you, you make an action. You decide on, on what, what you're going to be doing. Fourth is that you live with the consequences of those decisions, the intended and the unintended consequences of what you've decided. And then last, fifth, is that you look at uh, what meaning do you make? of all those four things that happen. So in those five things, there's two things that have to happen on uh, in between those. One is to do the steps one through five, you have to know who you are. You have to really be tuned into the truth of you so that when you're making decisions and having confidence and living with the consequences, you're doing it authentically and truthfully. The other thing is, and this happens between stage three and four the most, and this is the part that when I say um, uh, it's the tough part of agency that uh, can take a bit to grapple with is you have to have a tolerance for ambiguity. To be an agency, you have to, like when you make a decision, you have to, after you make the decision, the millisecond after to however long it takes for consequences to come to bear, you have to know you're going to be okay. You have to know that you can be agile and you can you can react in a favorable way or at least in a non-destructive way to how things go go um, afterwards. And this is typically where I meet people as a therapist when things have gone awry, when you have thought of one through five and you didn't think of the sixth thing that's going to happen. And uh, and the, the tolerance for ambiguity is a skill that we're not taught, just like we're not taught about agency. So you put all of those things together and you are able to be a person who is walking around authentically, who is feeling good. When, when people have their agency activated, the feeling that they say to me over and over again is, I feel really good. And I think we can all tune into a time in our life when we made a decision. We may not have thought through all those steps, but we're like that, I felt really good about it. And even if it went uh, to pot afterwards or it went fantastically, that wasn't the point. The point was I found my voice, I made a decision and I knew I was gonna be okay through it. And that, that changes a lot for people too. I just had that experience the other day. Oh, <laughs> it was, oh. It was the right decision, but I made it confidently in any event. <laughs> That's so, really so how do we, when you when we talk about agency through the lens of sexual self-confidence, mm -hmm. how do you modify through the lens of sexual self-confidence? Or does it all begin and end with sexual self-confidence and our sexual identity and the way we think about ourselves as sexual beings? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate the complexity of that question. And, and the my first answer to that is, I mean, I believe that our sexuality is our essence. So everything is related to sexuality, but that's just not what we're taught. That's not the common vernacular and understanding of sexuality. So that statement, especially when I started making it, was people like, what are you like? Because there are people are thinking I'm talking about sex acts or sexual orientation. And those things are a very important part of your sexuality, but it's not everything. That's not a holistic way of looking at your sexuality. 
So when you're looking at agency within sexuality, using the caveat that I'm defining sexuality holistically, that it's the it's the truth and the purest and the and the, the most deep sense of, of your soul, then looking at agency in this topic really matters because we well, as we said, you need we we're wanting to connect with people. We want to connect with people authentically, whether it's in a platonic relationship, a work relationship, a family relationship, or sexually. And for a lot of people, if you're connecting with someone sexually, it is a very vulnerable place to be. Not for everybody. For some people, that's the least place that that's vulnerable, but having a, an emotional information, a conversation would be the hardest. But in, in a lot of places, when people are showing up and connecting sexually, you are wanting to be an agency so that after the connect, during and after the connection, you're not feeling harm. You're not doing harm to the person or a people that you're doing this sexual connection with. And that everything feels like you are tuning into what you're, I call them yucks and yums. And that you're leaving the connection with um, being fully actuated, that you are really um, consenting enthusiastically and you are kindly uh, declining from the things that you're not wanting to be um, doing sexually. Can you, can you give us an example without obviously sharing any confidential information or breaking any confidences from your patients? Is it possible for you to share some examples with the listeners? Mm -hmm. I, yes, I have through the years collected from clients stories that they gave me consent for. So I, yes, I have ones that, that they're okay with me sharing. Um, so um, in thinking of uh, people who are like someone who's female identified having a sexual relationship with someone who's male identified, I, um, there's a common story that I heard, especially in giving oral sex. And, and so often what I'll hear from women, um, especially the first few times that they have experienced this, that when we go through the steps of agency in the context of those experiences, that I'll often hear things like, I just, before I knew it, I was, I was doing this. I don't ever remember saying yes. I don't necessarily ever remember being asked. All I know is I wanted him to like me and that felt great that I was getting attention. I don't think that it was non-consensual, but I also didn't say yes to this. So what does this mean? And afterwards, it, nothing changed in our relationship. It didn't feel good. It didn't get me the social currency I thought it was going to. And that felt really terrible. And so they look back on an experience like that, that that wasn't positive, that wasn't affirming, and that they didn't feel their agency was activated. They also sit there and often will have a time of grieving of, where was I? If I wasn't wanting to do this, how did I not find my voice to say no? Why, why was wanting him to like me more important and overriding that I didn't know what I was doing? I didn't want to be doing it. And he didn't really seem to care. And I don't use the story to demonize men. Just, just using an example that I've heard from, from a lot of, of women. And going back to those stories, when it's been 20 years or if it's been uh, a, a week, what's really important is to have self-compassion for when you were in experience that didn't have, uh, that you didn't have your agency activated because you didn't know. Um, and going back and finding where you could have had change in, the, in that, going back, what did that young lady need? What did that woman need um, to know? What could she have said? And then taking that information, moving forward to where you are now. And it's healing, it's self-compassion, uh, it is having a perspective and a context for it. And then it's using that to, to really build your confidence in other se sexual situations moving forward. And I want to give an example of sexual agency activated. So um, I had this exercise that is a four quadrant exercise that you fill in uh, with a list of sex acts. One, uh, you put a sex act in one of these four quadrants. And the four quadrants are things that I have done that I would like to do again things that I have done sexually that I don't think I want to do again, things that I haven't done that I think I want to try, things that I haven't done that seem like a no for me at, at this point. When people go through this, uh, and I often have couples go through this, um, all genders, uh, and it's a really profound experience to make a decision when you're not in a sexual situation of do I want to do the sex acts or do I not? 
Is this a yuck or is this a yum for me? That's one act. That's one way that agencies activate it. Uh, Cause a lot of times people will look at it like, I don't know. I don't, first of all, I don't even know what this is. Like, what is this sex act? This was this word me to begin with. And, and then I'm not sure if I want it. It depends. But what do you do with that depends and that nuance? It depends on if it's this person or it depends on how I'm feeling. And how do, how do I navigate consent when it's not even in the moment? So those are interesting places that you can activate your agency. But what's also exciting and what I do with my clients is that so they go through this quadrant and let's say they're working with their um, their partner and they are looking in their own agency of what they've decided they're directing them next to their partner who has done the same activity and they compare and contrast in an environment that's safe, that allows there to be differences to that really works hard to communicate without being judgmental or shutting someone else down and then looks at it as an exciting thing to find out what your partner wants and doesn't want, as opposed to like, a wow, or what, or this is devastating that we're never going to do this again. But having that information and consent is it's sexy, it's powerful, and it's beautiful, and it's actually going to get you a better kind of sex life um, to have a whole lot more enthusiastic yeses and enthusiastic noes. And then putting that into practice, communicating with your partner, this is what I want, this is what I don't want. And uh, I find that to be a really powerful way to activate agency. It sounds as though this should be part of sex education at a fairly early age. We, we are timid to have these conversations with young men and women, but it's, so, it's such an important part of figuring out the yucks and the yums and what you're willing to do and what you're, what feels good and what is consensual. We know that there are issues that affect young men and young women, which gives them great discomfort. And it has been the subject of what we now know as title, title IX issues. And I don't want to go down that path, but it would be helpful if you had figured out at an early age. So do you see that evolving Mm -hmm. I do. I am. Um, I actually used to do Title Nine talks um, about consent and coercion, and I found it so powerful. And I often got the feedback. I sure wish I'd had this when I was younger. And I was doing this at the college age, so I, I think it's never uh, it's never too late, and it's it's often never too early to be thinking to be parenting with consent in mind. That you are a parent who teaches your children, your young children, consent, uh, and and doing age appropriate teaching along the way. Uh, and and always checking in and it should be in, in both ways. You should always be looking at an elevated way that are you somebody that knows how to communicate consent to somebody else? And are you somebody who seeks consent? And that's not a gendered thing. That should be for all genders. And, it, and everyone is equally responsible for both of those things. But you're right. We're not taught it. Uh, in a lot of ways, it's better. I mean, it's, it's certainly getting better, but I also think it's still um, it's still a hot topic that is is uh, brings up a lot of emotions for people. And I wish it was something that was the emotion was curiosity instead of divisiveness. I I must say that I agree with you, having been involved with a lot of um, colleges and universities, and and having the topic uh, raised more than once. I can honestly say that um, it's something that we do need to start at a younger age and and at a, and an appropriate way. Correct. Um, you refer to agency as a superpower, and I, I'm I'm now appreciating this more. But I want to hear this in your own words. Why is it a superpower? Mm -hmm. You know, I I will also say that agency changed my life and it saved my life. I, um, I find it to be a superpower because it is, it's the, you know, talk about elevated sexual education, which I really believe needs to happen. And I think agency is the superpower that makes sex education elevated. And I think that when we, when we realize that who we are and what we want and what we need matters, that changes a lot. So much of how people are taught to interact in the world, to show up in the world and people pleasing and not creating a fuss or not taking up space or that taking up space is too much or is too audacious or it's too hard. It's if you've had consequences of taking up space that were negative, if you've been in relationships where 
your opinion didn't matter or it was dangerous to give your opinion, it changes you. It changes how, de how the depth of the connections that you can make and the meaningfulness that you can have in the world. And agency allows you to find that again. I have a course that's just on teaching um, agency. We just, I just did one now. Today was our last day for it. And we read stories uh, about either you can choose a story that agency was activated or agency wasn't activated. I always like end up crying in it. It's so beautiful when someone says, this changed how I show up to people and it feels good. And people are responding well to this. I wish I'd done it earlier, but I'm doing it now. And that that the example that you gave that you did it today and you said that it felt good and, you know, kind of who knows what you know happens with it or what your details were. But that feeling of feeling good is contagious. It's contagious in your own life and it's contagious around people, uh, people around you, which is another thing that feels exciting to me. You know, there's a lot of talk about boundaries. Uh, uh, about empowerment. And, and this is my view. And I, I, I never wanted to offend people who uh, have expertise in those areas, but this is how I kind of construct the, how those things work together. Boundaries to me are the beginning level of how you are getting to agency. Um, so, and, and boundaries that kind of advance. So if that's maybe like the elementary level, then if you're getting to middle school, you understand that boundaries are about the boundaries that you make for yourself and the, and the rules and agreements you have for how you are in the world and interacting in the world, not looking at boundaries as in your way of keeping people out and rules for other people. Then after that, after you kind of understand the difference of those two as you're moving up in, in, in your elevated thinking, then the next thing is empowerment. So in empowerment, you are finding your voice you are finding your way. It is like, yes, like this feels good to speak up for myself or yes, this is what I need and this is what I want. And, and that's beautiful. But there's a limitation to what empowerment is. And empowerment is limited because it's mainly individual. And there's only so far that you can go in your empowerment if it is contained by who you are and that's and 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 that it isn't dealing with interaction. Where agency gets to like the P so if if empowerment is kind of like going to college, the agency in your life is going to get your doctorate. And agency adds all boundaries and advanced boundaries and empowerment, but it takes you to doing all of those things, adding the skill of agency into it and doing it in community with others. So that's why, to me, it's the superpower because, yes, you find your voice. Yes, you know what are your yeses and your noes with boundaries for yourself and for others. But you also do that in relation to others. Not always, not when people are, are empowered, they're not always doing that in relationship with others. And we need that. We need that in this world right now with peace. We need this in our relationships. And we need to know how to have how to be a fully formed person with opinions and needs and wants next to another person, our spouse, our best friend, our child, and respect their needs and wants and differences, especially when there's in conflict. Great when it happens in ease, but hard when it's in conflict. And then in a larger way, doing this in communities, doing this in countries, doing this in groups of people, when you can be an agency in community, everything changes. And it is irrespective of how you define your sexuality. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. That, that's the gift of agency is that it is individual for uh, your wants and your needs. And also, is it threatened by differences of others? If you are an agency, you're not threatened by others and you're not threatening others. You're not marginalizing people and you're not... Uh, well, you can't prevent people from marginalizing you, but it is um, it's a place where you get to be contained and whole and protected because you're guiding yourself and you are not interacting with others in an emotional reactive state. You're grounded into the essence of who you are. And when you're there, even though you can still hurt and you can still be hurt, you are still able to be who you are and the truth of you are, whether it's orientation or gender or any differences. So how is it that, um, or how do cultural and social um, characteristics help to form or shape feelings about sex and sex positivity and sexual self-confidence? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Uh, a lot. <laughs> that's, that's the short answer to it. It affects it greatly. Uh, it is, it's interesting. And it depends on what religion we're talking about, what race we're talking about, what culture we're talking about. Even the era makes a big difference. Everything intersects with our sexuality. Everyone has a body. Everyone has sexuality. And ev all the details surrounding that are different. It makes an enormous difference how you're experiencing your race against and next to somebody uh, who has a different race and a different culture from you. What your generational knowledge has been, what the cultural knowledge is, what the era is happening alongside what's happening politically, what is happening in the messages you've received from religion along the way. And also what permission are you given yourself and permission that you're given in your smaller communities and families and in the larger communities to dissect what those messages are. I, one of my favorite activities to do along the lines of the things that have, the, the parts of our lives that have informed what we think sexuality should and shouldn't be is one of the first things I was talking about is that we we're rarely, rarely people talk to me about feeling like, you know, my sexuality is perfect. Like it's, it's great. It's, it's just right. No one does. And it's not just self-selected, but we're just, we are taught to com always be comparing ourselves to this. Add in race, add in the spirituality and religion and culture to it. And we now have a huge list of shoulds and shouldn'ts and do's and don'ts and wrongs and rights. And I'm better than you. And that is scary and weird and all those things added to it. So one of the things I like to do is this exercise. It's kind of like cleaning out the closets. Um, no metaphor intended in that. That it's you're looking at what is... What was I taught? What was I taught by my race, my culture, my religion about self-pleasure? What was I taught about what it meant to be uh, a gay woman? What does it mean to, uh, what was I taught about the sexuality of a woman in her seventies? What, who taught me these things? Where did I get these messages? And then do I want to keep them or not? So we look at, like, are we going to recycle it and tweak it? Are we going to keep it and this gets to stay in our closet? Or are we donating and trashing it, getting rid of it? And that's a practice of agency to do your, your yeses and your noes. But it's also a really deep reflection of let's be kind to ourselves as to that's why it's complicated to unpack who you are as a sexual being, because you're not in a bubble. You are interacting in a world with media. You're interacting with people who have lots of opinions and you have a lot of ways that people can tell you what their opinions are, whether you want to hear them or you don't. And if you're living in a multi-generational household, it can get really complicated. Yes, it sure can. Yes. <laughs> yes. So just think, just reflecting back on my own upbringing and I won't get into too much detail here. But just thinking about the uh, multi generational family that I was in, which I was raised, and thinking about you know some of the customs and some of the, um, I would say proclivities that weren't necessarily proclivities that I would subscribe to. I, I can definitely attest to uh, how how that can really impact one's uh, sexual positivity and sexual confidence. <laughs> it does, and it's interesting, and it's not even predictive either. It's interesting to me, like there's some people that were raised in a home that it was um, very open and really communicative and really supportive. And that uh, didn't necessarily mean that that's how they uh, felt in their own sexuality. And then just the reverse that somebody was, um, it was a no, no, you don't talk about it. That's bad. There's, here's, the, here's the list of five things that makes you a good girl. And if you're not doing it, you are not making the list. But yet then they have a, a freedom in their sexuality. It's interesting. It's, it's, it's an interesting journey. Um, and it's something that I wish our sex education focused on more. It, it, would, it, would, not, um, it would not prevent me, I can tell you, from having this conversation when my daughter was in middle school. So I raised this topic when she was in middle school, not about agency, but about how sex education might be modified so that young women had a better sense of self. I didn't know it was agency at the time, but I'm not sure that we've made a ton of progress, but here you are. So yeah. we're, we're, a good we're, fight. we're <laughs> hoping yeah. you're the game changer here, Juliana. <laughs> I want to, oh, I hope so. I'm, I'm trying. There's, there's, there's a, a, an army of us that are, that are doing our best. 
I um I'll give you one example too. And uh, my mom actually may be watching. She's one of my uh, one of my my favorite fans. And um, it's interesting because you know she was which I met generational things. She wasn't raised in a home or in an environment or an era where it was polite to talk about sex and sexuality. And there were uh, lots of unspoken rules in it. And, and that's in a lot of ways how she was raising my sister and I, because that's what she knew. And I was always viewed as this kind of, I was kind of a curious child. I was naked all the time running around horrifying my sister and not even knowing, you know, what I, what I was doing. And, um, and my mom and I's journey has been so interesting because you know, I, I wanted to talk about it and I was interested in learning more about sex and sexuality well before I came, got into it professionally. And like when the first time that she realized that I had been sexually active, she about fainted and it, it was you know a big talk that we had had to now she and I have conversations. We can talk and she can use the word self-pleasure and we can talk about, she listens and, and reads and looks at my work and even if there still may be some discomfort, she understands the value of it and the importance of it. And um, that has carried on to my children. And, uh, and that's, it's a beautiful thing that multi-generation can heal, uh, can learn and grow. And it's another example that our sexuality is with us from birth until death. And again, it's never too late to get into this topic, it's never too late to have those conversations with multiple generations um, or lateral generations. And in fact, it can be quite beautiful because again, if you look at your sexuality as beyond just having sex acts, then really what you're doing is you are deepening relationships with people in your life. Um, it just us, we just have made sex acts taboo and the headliner. So um, we're getting to a point where we need to have some wisdom from you. We've had a lot of wisdom, but if you had the opportunity to share three pieces of wisdom with our audience, what would they be? And I'm also getting some questions here. So I want to make sure that we have time for um, at least a couple of questions from our Facebook followers. So we'll start with your three pieces of wisdom. Okay, great. Uh, the first is, and this is something that I had um, spoken uh, to before, which is I want everyone to know that what you need and want matters and that it's worth finding out who you are and what are your yeses and nos inside of sexual connection and outside of it. I, um, I really believe that that statement is profound if you sit with it. And, and also become someone who shows others that what they need and want matters and that you sit and you listen to their answer um, if you ask them. Uh, next would be that I want you to really start listening and sinking in to the concept of agency, that there's, a, that there's an important nuanced difference between being entitled, being empowered and being an agency. And, uh, and start listening for the word, start looking um, for yourself, start looking for people who talk about what you're saying, Jerry, you did today. Look for agency mentors. When someone is talking about how they make a decision and how they live with the consequences of their decisions, ask, ask, what do you do when things go, go awry? How do you handle that ambiguity? What do, meaning do you make of it? And then become mentors for others also so that we have a ripple effect of agent, people in agency in a larger community. And then I would say, in looking at sexuality, I some of my favorite tips in having an elevated sexuality is the, the final bit of wisdom. And that's that sexuality is fun. It does not have to be this serious thing that we're afraid to talk about and don't put a value to sexuality being fun. Have it be something that is meaning like a value is in like, it's a bad thing. I want it to be something that it's, why shouldn't our sexuality be a good thing and a fun thing? Why can't it be a connector between us instead of a divider? I also love for people to look at vibrancy in their life as a way to reconnect with their sexuality and start with things outside of sexual connection so that you can then 
use that spark as a catalyst inside of sexual connection. And then finally, um, I love for people to start using the word yucks and yums instead of um, looking at as in shoulds and shouldn'ts and feeling like they have to do something instead of um, things being enthusiastic, consensual and what they want to do. Well, I'm going to definitely use yucks and yums, yums, uh, and I'll encourage my friends and especially my daughter to use yucks and yums as she thinks about agency and, and what she's willing to accept and not accept. But we have a question uh, from one of the members of our Facebook following, and it's a confidential question to you. How can couples work on sex confidence together? Mm -hmm. And uh, and what a what a beautifully stated question. And it's it's wonderful to um, to to first of all, what I hear in that question is that they're a team, and that's a really important part when you are looking to change. Um, whether it's because things are feeling super disconnected or because it's going well and you want things to be different and and better, you first need to look at it. You're a team that you're not against each other, not one person is right or wrong, but that this is a problem that you are looking at together and you both would be part of the solution in having that. The other thing is, is that you need to own, do your, you need to do your own work. You needed to go look at where are you in your own sexual journey. First, you have to understand you have a sexual journey that is separate and apart from each other and that you have a third part, which is sexual journey that you have together. So do the work. Take responsibility for healing what needs to be healed so that your wounds aren't bumping up against the, your partner's wounds and learn to have communication. The, the key to really having good communication is creating safety. So if you want to be sexually confident with your with your partner, you need to know how to create safety with your partner so that your partner can show up authentically. Your, your partner can show up and say that what your partner needs and wants or wants to stop doing. And you need to to not assume that the way you need to what you need from your partner and how they speak to you or an environment of safety is the same thing. And I'm, I'm really not speaking physical safety. That is the, the baseline of how, what should be happening. I'm talking about the emotional safety that where somebody feels safe enough to be vulnerable and to con and to connect in a deep way. Then you go to one of the pieces that I gave earlier, which is I want you to have. An, a, an attitude of curiosity. So my favorite word beside, or my favorite sound besides the sound of somebody having pleasure uh, is, huh. I love the sound, huh, the word, huh. And that's the tone and the vibe of curiosity. So when couples are figuring out who they are sexually and wanting to be confident themselves and with each other, then when something goes uh, awry and it's like, oh, that was a no or, you know, and sex can be so messy and weird and all those things. It should be like, huh, well, that didn't work. All right. So let's go on to the next thing instead of like, oh, that didn't work or like that didn't work. Like those those are natural and understandable emotions, but those are divisive when you're trying to look at um, becoming confident together. But if you have the atmosphere of like, okay, now we know that's a no for us or that's a yuck for us. Let's move on to the next thing. Every bit of information should be confidence building because you're learning more about yourself and learning more about each other. And, and having yeses and no shouldn't feel threatening. It should feel inspiring. Those things make a difference. And then you add in after the huh, you add in fun. Uh, there's a lot of fun to be had in the wide range of way to be intimate with somebody emotionally, physically, and sexually. So there are, there are a couple of other questions that have come in. Um, and one concerns pain during intercourse um, and it has really eroded the self-confidence. Um, this is a private message. It's eroding the self-confidence of this individual. And I will respond to that because sexual pain is not okay and there are ways in which to address pain during intercourse and it may be a, a physiological issue that involves vaginal or vulvar dryness there are over-the-counter and um, prescription products that can be recommended we obviously have a product called mia vita it's a mia vita product line it is made without hormones and it can be used um, if you are having pain during intercourse, 
It may help things. It can be used on a regular basis to alleviate some of the symptoms of dryness, but, but that may be one area where you want to investigate to see if you are experiencing something that is physiological that's causing you pain and, and address that. And obviously there are some other issues that might be causing pain and maybe you want to delve into those, uh, Juliana. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, you answered that beautifully uh, on the, the medical side of things. And I would add to that also that um, I have um, also seen some pretty wonderful things happening with pelvic floor therapists that can make a very big difference in, um, in pain or intercourse. But I really love what you said, uh, which is that it's not okay. And there are many ways to hit... Um, uh, the the issue of pain during intercourse and it's not it's something that you don't have to suffer through and suffer through alone. A lot of women experience this and um, and companies like you that are doing so much that it matters. I'm so grateful for your company for it mattering uh, and for spreading the word that there are ideas and things that you can do. Um, outside of any kind of medical intervention, um, the work that I like to do too is just kind of go back and look at sexual trauma to look at emotional trauma related to sexuality, to look at um, what people are, um, what they need for safety in a relationship and safety in uh, what the sex act is um, and working through the anxiety that often becomes uh, synergistic in the experience. Um, there really is hope in having relief from that, but it's typically multifaceted in how you go about it. We have one last question. We're getting close to the end of our broadcast. And the question is, what are the biggest mistakes you can make while practicing agency? And the second part of the question is, how do you begin acting in agency within the relationships you've built without practicing agency? Mm, great, great question. Yes, it's so great. So the first one about, um, I I'm not sure what the biggest mistake is, but... Um, some of the mistakes that can be made when you are practicing agency is one, thinking that you have to do it perfectly, uh, that there are many ways that um, you can start beginning it and they don't have to be these big, huge things. Um, you can you can activate agency in smaller ways and in uh, relationships that are safe, that want you to be an agency next to them. I think also a mistake that we make in beginning with agency is that we can shift pretty quickly uh, there's a fine balance sometimes between being an agency and being entitled um, because often when you start feeling, feeling in agency, it feels good. And you're like, ah, no one's going to take this good feeling from me. I'm going to be an agency everywhere. And that's not agency because if you are only thinking of yourself in the process of your decision making only and not thinking about how you're communicating or relating or the ripple effects amongst others, then um, you aren't going to get the results you want because the community or the person that you're interacting with is um, it's going to have a difficult time with that. Also, not assuming that everyone wants you to be an agency, because sometimes when you're an agency, it doesn't benefit people that you're in a relationship with. And so they may react poorly to that. And the meaning you make of that, the step five of agency needs to not be, oh, it's bad and dangerous. It's, like, oh, where does my stuff end and someone else's stuff begin? And it's important to be diligent about really staying with how am I feeling about agency? Did I activate this fully? And what does this mean next to this person's agency or lack thereof? Um, the second part of the question about how do you begin acting the agency in a relationship where there wasn't any, that, that's a good, that's a doozy. It's a good one. It's difficult. And that's answered with the, with the second part of what I just said, which is some relation, you, when you are meeting people, whether it's friendships or a romantic or sexual or familiar relationship, you start making unofficial, if not official agreements and rules of how we're going to interact. It is difficult unless it's mutually consensual to change our agreements and the way that we're going to interact with each other. If one person's when, if one person's changing their their agency activation and the other one hasn't mutually consented, then there can be a lot of problems. And sometimes what that means is that, is that the relationship ends. And sometimes it means that the couple gets 
uh, whether again, whether it is uh, a mother and daughter or it is um, a, a marriage that you um, you look at, OK, we're a team. Let's change this together. Let's mutually agree that this isn't working for us and let's practice and let's be compassionate as we're practicing this because this isn't about being perfect. There's no way you are. I've been teaching this and working this 20 years and I'm still not, I haven't perfected agency by any means. And there's many times that I'm like, oh, yep, didn't do agency in that. Wish I could go back and say that differently. And, and I've learned to know what my triggers are. It's a really big thing. Maybe that's another answer for a mistake in agency is know what your triggers are because when you're being emotionally reactive, you're not being an agency and you're not able to activate those steps of agency. So in identifying what my, what my triggers are, I can get out of that quicker, not perfectly and not every single time, but quicker. And I can also repair and recover from anything I've done that's damaging or a part that I've been damaged by somebody not being an agency too. That makes a big difference. So I'm gonna put in a plug for your courses. And one of those is in agency. Visit Dr. Juliana's website. You'll learn more about ways in which you can enroll in these classes to help you, help your partner, help your family. Dr. Juliana Hauser, it is indeed a pleasure to have you as our guest. Mm. And I'm looking forward to the next time. And I'm going to sign up for your course. Ah, yes. I'm so yes, excited. Please. I can't wait. Thank, thank you, you so much. Time. And thank you to all of those that tuned in to the Facebook Live. I promise there will be a next one. Dr. Juliana and everyone, please stay well and take care of yourself. Thank you, Cherry. Thank you.